The political divide has sharpened as always. But we want to raise the big question. The central question is, has India really become a Vishwa Guru? Or is there hype? Or is there substance to it? Is this India's moment in a way on the global high table? That's the question I'm going to pose. My first guest on this is Amitabh Khan. Mr. Khan, G20 Sherpa, congratulations first of all on the success of the G20 summit. You've been going through endless negotiations night after night. Have you been able to sleep and have you finally been able to catch up on some sleep after all these hectic days? Well, not yet, but we'll may, I'll duly make up for it in the coming days. You'll make up for it in the coming days. But I must ask you this. While we do this post-mortem in a way of the G20 summit, one word that I've heard very often, particularly in government circles, is India's arrival as Vishwa Guru, India's Vishwa Guru moment as a global leader. Do you really believe that we are on the way to becoming a Vishwa Guru? Or is that hype more than substance immediately after uh, the summit concluded successfully? Well, I would uh, term it as a, uh, as a moment for being a Vishwa Mitra because, uh, you know, the, the consensus document which has come out uh, across all issues really demonstrates India's unique ability to bring emerging markets and the developed world together, including Russia and China. Uh, it's also a voice for multilateralism. It's a voice for the global south. It's a very, very strong voice of putting development and growth center stage. And I think it's a very powerful uh, New Delhi leaders declaration. Uh, I don't think a declaration of uh, this nature has come out before from G20. And I think uh, it needs to be studied and examined. Uh, I would say that this is a this is a unique moment because mm -hmm. uh, there were several complexities on issues of uh, climate, on energy. Uh, there were challenges on uh, the geopolitical issue. We managed to bring everybody together and bring out a consensus, a fully consensus document on all issues, which to my mind is a very unique achievement of India. You know, it's interesting you're using the word Vishwamitra and not Vishwaguru. In that sense, it appears you are suggesting that India's role at G20 was much more of a bridge builder rather than telling the world in which direction they have to go. Am I broadly correct that, broadly speaking, the new wordage that you would prefer is Vishwamitra and not Vishwaguru? Well, I won't say anything on that. Count. That's not my objective. Mm -hmm. I mean, my task is to uh, really deliver a good G20 in terms of its content. Uh, my job was to not to get caught up on these issues. My job is very professional job of working uh, with different countries, both emerging markets and developed world, and uh, to bring out a, a unique document and unique New Delhi leaders a declaration, uh, which is what I worked for, really. I don't want to get caught up in, uh, you know, semantics over this. No, no, you don't want to get caught up in semantics, uh, Mr. Kant. Uh, fair enough. But let's look at then the content. As you said, the document, uh, all the paragraphs, 80, 80 plus represent, you're saying a broad consensus. Now, there will be those who, having read it, will say all it does is restate first principles, whether it is uh, in the context of what happened in Ukraine, where it doesn't specifically mention Russia, but speaks on general principles of the UN Charter against territorial aggression, or whether it's on climate change, or whether it's on sustainable growth, it only restates first principles. What do you believe is concrete and substantive from this document that you believe is the one big takeaway that reflects the essence then of the Delhi Declaration? So first, uh, that it's a very strong call for bringing growth and development center stage. It focuses on very strong, uh, inclusive, sustainable growth. It focuses on accelerating the pace of sustainable development goals uh, because the COVID has impacted a vast segment of population. It uh, focuses very strongly on 
a green development pact between the G20 countries, uh, laying emphasis on both climate action, climate finance, uh, global biofuel uh, alliance. It focuses on green hydrogen. It focuses on ending uh, plastics. It focuses on uh, the lifestyle for environment life initiative, whole range of initiative on green development pact. It then focuses on multilateral institutions for the 21st century uh, because you need finance for both SDG and uh, for climate action. Uh, these institutions were constituted in the post uh, Bretton Woods period, uh, post World War II. They need to be restructured and redesigned, which it talks about uh, with consensus. And then it focuses very strongly on technological development and digital public infrastructure. For the first time, the world has accepted the definition uh, of digital public infrastructure and the framework to accompany DPIs, which are open source, open APIs, uh, are interoperable. And therefore, I think India has made a big headway on that. And lastly, uh, the document focuses very strongly on uh, uh, women-led development, that's women empowerment and gender equality. It's a very unique document on laying emphasis on women empowerment. So all these are very key features. Mm -hmm. And lastly, I must say that there's a focus on creating a more inclusive world by bringing in uh, African Union as a member of the G, permanent member of the G20. So these are the broad, broad key highlights of the New Delhi leaders uh, you know, uh, Mr. Khan, there is no doubt that bringing in the African Union, which you just uh, mentioned into the G20, must be seen as a major achievement. No doubt about it. But do you really believe that the balance of power between the global South and the powerful Western nations has been truly redrawn? Are you really seeing that countries will actually now walk the talk on critical issues of climate finance, of, of ensuring that the war in Ukraine ends? Will the concerns of the Global South on, on, on debt restructuring actually be acted upon? Will all of this remain only on paper? So if you look at the document, for the, I think this is the first document which the G20 has produced. And let me clearly say that G20 is not G7. It comprises also of emerging markets. And uh, therefore, uh, there's a whole focus on... Uh, the global south, there's a whole focus on developing countries. There's a big focus on emerging markets. And that is why on both climate action, climate finance, or the reform of the multilateral institutions, mm -hmm. the global south has had a big say. Before we started the G20, the prime minister had held a meeting with all the leaders of the global south, 125 leaders, taken their priorities. And therefore, this document is really a document of the global south in many ways the number of times you will see developing countries emerge out of this document is is quite extraordinary and the concerns and their voice has been greatly felt in this document and i would really request all of you to kindly read through this document because it's highly inclusive it's very very decisive and it's very action oriented now you've used the word inclusive mr khan several times already now let me turn to some of the contentious issues how much of this summit success or indeed this inclusivity that you speak about the consensus building was because of the prime minister's personal intervention his personal personalized style of diplomacy i recall interviewing you one year ago when you just taken over as g20 sherpa and you said you were going to take g20 across india and you did that with 220 meetings over 60 cities but critics are saying the prime minister has then used this uh, to boost his domestic image, that while we talk of Vasudeva Kutumbakam for the world, the la of one family, one world, have we been able to do that in India as well? Actually build bridges within this country? So G20 is, uh, uh, basically when India hosts the G20, the leader of G20 is the prime minister. It has to have his stamp. Uh, it has to have his vision. Uh, it's a leadership driven organization and i am being the share i am the sherpa to the prime minister of india and therefore i implement what the leader desires in this and his vision was to take g20 
to all the states of India, to 60 cities of India, to make it a people-centric G20. That's very unlike what other G20s are about. They are held in one city or two cities. Mm -hmm. So that's his vision. His vision was that we should only give uh, one district, one product gifts. His vision was that we should utilize millets. His vision was that we should bring in digital public infrastructure Mm -hmm. as a very major component of our presidency. His vision was that women-led development should be a very major criteria of our G20 presidency. All all this, there's a huge India narrative into the New Delhi leader's statement. And this has all been driven uh, at the highest level by the Prime Minister. His vision was that our uh, motto should be one earth, one family, one future. His vision was that it should be revolved around Vasudev Kutumakam. And therefore, uh, all this is really uh, being driven at that level. But was the Prime Minister's vision also to, in a way, identify G20 with his own personality? Because we are now entering an election year, is G20 being used in some way to build the Prime Minister's larger-than-life image, as I said earlier at the start, to build him as a Vishwa Guru, or dare I say now, as you say, Vishwa Mitra? Uh, Rajdeep, I don't think we should bring uh, politics into this issue at all. Uh, the G20 has been very professionally organized. Mm. It's been a, a you know, stupendous uh, achievement in terms of being able to arrive at a consensus document, not merely on all growth and development issues. This is the first document with 83 paras, without a bracket, without a footnote, without any reservation whatsoever. All countries across uh, 20 countries, plus the nine invited countries, plus all the international organizations agree to it 100% taking it forward. I do not think it has anything to do with politics. We have been able to give a different perspective and bring everybody around uh, and take this forward. Uh, there are components of it which come mm-hmm. in from various other parts of the world, but the Indian narrative is fully intact there in a very big way. You know, the, the reason I brought in the politics is because your fellow Stephanian, uh, Congress MP, uh, Shashi Tharoor, with whom you had a bit of a, a Twitter exchange said, and I quote him now, uh, this diplomatic triumph makes it all the more a pity that the government does not bring the same attitude of conciliation and cooperation to bear in its domestic dealings. The failure to invite the leader of the opposition, indeed any opposition MP, to any of the G20 events, receptions, dinners, underscores my point. No other democracy would snub its uh, its parliamentary colleagues on a global stage like this. A pity that the spirit of accommodation that prevailed at G20 is absent within Indian politics. How do you respond to what uh, Shashi Tharoor uh, has to say on this, this criticism. No, I have the greatest regard and respect for Shashi Tharoor, but I saw at the dinner, I saw all the opposition chief ministers were there. Mr. Stalin was there, Mr. Nitish Kumar was there, the Jharkhand chief minister was there. Everyone was there from opposition side. I mean, there were many, many chief ministers. They are running the states. They came and met all the top leaders of the world. They were, I I, I met them personally there. So I don't think uh, that would be a correct uh, criticism of the government on this. Okay, but some of the Congress chief ministers did not attend. Leader of opposition uh, was not invited. You're saying there was not a conscious decision in any way at any stage to keep anyone out. Am I correct? I don't think there was any intention of that nature by the government and I don't want to get caught up in these issues at all. Okay, let's look at the larger picture once again. There's now talk, Mr. Kant, of a virtual summit in November before India's presidency ends. What is this virtual summit going to be about? What is the need you believe for a virtual summit now that the declaration is in place and Brazil is all set to take over the presidency of the G20? So Brazil takes over on the 1st of December. We had advanced our presidency, but our presidency remains till the 1st of December, till the 30th of November, really. We have a lot of time. That is the entire September, October, November, till end November. So what the prime minister has desired is that on the New Delhi leaders' declaration, and quite quite often happens that G20 statements really remain on paper. He wants us to drive them in terms of execution with different countries, different states, the number of India-related issues, drive them to implementation, and then have a virtual summit to review it. 
to review the action taken. And uh, that, to my mind, would be the right thing to do. We have two, two, uh, two months, two and a half months, and plenty of things need to be done during the course of our presidency. So we'll take them forward. So, so what you're saying, in a way, is that this uh, virtual summit in November will be a final act, a kind of review of what we've achieved, the hits and the misses. Is that the purpose, sole purpose then of a, having another virtual summit in November? That's right. To review uh, the outcomes of the document as well as many other things which we'd like to cover, which the leaders would like to talk about. So mm -hmm. this is an occasion for leaders to interact. You know, there's a, uh, the, the good thing about the new leader summit is not merely the document uh, being achieved with full 100% consensus <coughs> on all issues. But the meeting and the talking to each other is a is that connection is very important amongst global leaders. And I think when they do a virtual summit again uh, uh, in <coughs> end of November, we'll have to do a lot of spade work, a lot of homework. We'll uh, do that. Uh, and to my mind, that will be a very good initiative. You know, one issue which needs clarification is the amount of money that you've spent on the G20. Some are suggesting we've spent six times the amount that countries like Germany spent on the summit. We've spent way more than what Indonesia spent on last year's Bali summit. Is that true? Figures on the net are suggest that more than 4,000 crores uh, could even go up to 10,000 have actually been spent. Uh, the hoardings that we see all across uh, the country, one report said just from the Delhi airport to the U.S. President's Hotel, there were over 920 G20 ads. 25% of them featuring the Prime Minister. Can you tell us how much was actually spent? Do we have a real number of how much was spent on the G20? Rajiv, let me tell you that don't go by fake news. You know, this is absolutely nonsensical news that we've spent 4,032 crore. Absolutely incorrect, improper, fake news. And I would request you in particular not to go by this kind of fake news. Th there was a budget approved, which was far lesser. And we've spent less than the budget, uh, than the approved budget by the government. So the budget approved is, the expenditure is far less than even the budget approved. So I, I would suggest that uh, uh, I, you just wait for the expenditure to be uh, uh, cross-corrected, everything, and these figures will be there in the public domain. So the approved budget is there, and we have spent even much lesser than that. And I would request you not to get carried away by some some uh, uh, some incorrect and improper tweet by someone. So I'm, I'm, to be, I'm not getting carried away. I'm asking for clarification. Do you have a rough estimate, then a ballpark figure, sir, of how much the G20 summit has cost? That is that is still being compiled. The event has just concluded yesterday. It is being compiled by our logistic division. It'll be it's everybody everybody will get to know what is the expenditure. It's there's an approval and the expenditure is less than the approval line. Okay. We we'll keep a track of the expenditure, but you mentioned in one of your statements post the summit that this is a victory for Team India. You work with a team of very fine young IFS officers for you personally. What has been the biggest learning over the last year? You've been a bureaucrat for decades. What's the new learning you had as the G20 Sherpa? That uh, you have to be professionally very well prepared. You know, the negotiators from across the world are very tough. They know strategically what they want to achieve. They're very professional. And India needs to build up a team of very strong professionals. I think in our negotiations, we've done some very, very tough negotiations. This has been an incredibly tough negotiation spreading over weeks and weeks and weeks and months. And India needs to have continuity in its negotiators over a long period of time with full professional expertise. That will make you win for the country. I think what has won this year is that we are a team of very top class good dra drafting team we are a very good top class negotiators and some really outstanding young officers who worked with us uh, to deliver this presidency for india you know one, one final question mr khan you said that this is you know you told me a year ago that this was going to be your last big hurrah i recall saying you saying something like this in an interview you gave me that you know this is it and then you're going to quit the government your last big project in a sense with the government now there is some buzz that next general election, a lot of retired IS, IFS officers could contest the election. We asked Harsh Shringla, the G20 coordinator, former foreign secretary, yesterday whether he would contest from Darjeeling. He didn't rule it out. 
Are you also someone who might be considering moving from being a bureaucrat who's worn various hats to possibly now contesting elections or entering political life, Mr. Khan? Rajiv, I have uh, no such political ambition. I just want to read and write, and I, I prefer to write and do some intellectual work. So I'll I'll do that. Uh, do that. You know, I just want to relax and take life easy. I worked for a very long time in government, and I now like to chill out a little bit. So how, how does Amitabh Khan chill out? Are you going to play another more rounds of golf? Are we going to see a book on the G20 year? Are you going to go back to your original uh, home state of Kerala, where you were a bureaucrat uh, with incredible uh, with the Kerala tourism campaign, play golf somewhere or discover maybe a course in Kerala or just sit by the beach? No, no, I'll, uh, I of course do a lot of physical exercise and I play golf and I play several games, but uh, I, you know, I, I do that as a daily, daily a part of my daily existence. But I, I would prefer to read and write, and I've, I've written several books, and I'd prefer to write another book on my own experiences of G20 rather than doing anything else. But uh, I'm not cut out for politics. Okay, you're not cut out for politics, but you made an emphatic statement here. Uh, but you are cut out for diplomacy, and you've done a rather remarkable job over the last year putting it all together. Thank you so much, Amitabh Khan, for joining us here on uh, as we look back at the G20 summit.